Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers. I realize in a very embarrassed fashion that you just saw the cover for last year's edition of the Prairie Garden. We are, of course, gathered here virtually today to celebrate Smaller Places, which is the 2022 edition of the Prairie Garden. We have a number of contributors here that you'll be hearing from, but first, I just wanted to go over a few details of today's event. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting from Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself is located on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Roostertown. I'm just going to quickly go over what you'll be seeing this afternoon. So following my introduction, we'll then be moving on to presentations from both our guest editor and from one of the contributors, after which there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. Please note that any questions can just be placed in the Q&A box, which is just at the bottom of the screen. Rest assured, you can type a question in there at any point and it will not interfere with the event. And we'll get to those questions as time permits. There is also a chat function that is activated, so if you'd like to talk amongst yourselves, offer any comments or commentary throughout the afternoon, please feel free to do so. I'll be sure to share that chat with tonight's participants so that they can all see all the very lovely things that you inevitably had to say. Copies of the 2022 Prairie Garden, Smaller Places, are available from McNally Robinson Booksellers, both here and in Saskatoon, and of course at our Fork store as well. Uh, they're available in person, they're available online, and they're also available over the phone. We deliver uh, locally in Winnipeg via Courier, and nationally and internationally via Canada Post. And I'm just going to put that information in the chat as well. But that's more than enough from me. I'll return to host the Q&A when it comes time for questions. But first, I'd like to introduce the editor of this volume and your host for this afternoon. Dorothy Doby is the publisher of Canada's local gardener magazine, formerly Manitoba Gardener, Ontario Gardener, and Alberta Gardener. She hosted a popular radio show for 20 years and currently hosts a digital radio show at Lifestyle 55 Digital Radio and co-hosts a garden podcast with her daughter, Shauna Doby, at localgardener.net. Dorothy is the chair of the International Peace Garden, is a member of the board of Tree Canada, and is a member of the committee organizing 2022 as the year of the garden in Canada. Please join me in virtually welcoming Dorothy Doby. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here today. And my, you see, I have a sidekick. Mr. Tomato is with me. You'll be hearing more about uh, from him a little bit later. But uh, for the meantime, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what's coming up in the Prairie Garden. So let me just take you to uh, the slideshow that I have prepared for you. And um, let me also say that uh, this is the second virtual launch of the Prairie Garden, and I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in today. I want to also thank John Taves, whom you just heard from at McNally Robinson Booksellers, because they do a lot of work to make this possible. And we really do have an exciting line of stories this year to share with you, thanks to the hard work of our committee and our many, many contributors. Our previous editor, uh, Linda Dietrich, sent me a copy of the presentation she did last year. So you'll notice, you probably have seen some of these pictures, but I didn't think it would hurt to remind you that we, we go back, according to Linda, a very long time. As she said, aside from the three years during World War II, the Prairie Garden has been published every year since 1937. Originally, it was the annual report and yearbook of the Canadian, of the Winnipeg Horticultural Society. The title was the Winnipeg Flower Garden, and then the flower garden until in 1957, its readership had expanded across the whole prairies and it was renamed the Prairie Garden. And I just want to say that these are some of the folks that have helped put it together this year. They're all volunteers. And I think it's very important that we recognize that. Uh, originally the book was published by the, uh, the Prairie Garden, the Hort Winnipeg Horticultural Society. But uh, since it disbanded in 2000, it has been published by the Prairie Garden Committee. And these are some of the folks, or these are all of the folks that worked on it this year. I want to thank all the members of the committee who put in lots of volunteer hours, proofreading, editing, fact-checking content. And we couldn't do this without them. And certainly the cost of the book would mu be much higher without all that volunteer labor. I would also like to thank Carl Thompson from Pegasus Publications for his fine work in doing the layouts and Premier Printing, who did the printing. And most of all, we want to thank our sponsors. I mean, take a look at these guys. This is the who's who of gardening, 
uh, organizations in, in the, the local region. And without them, the cost of the publication would also be much, much higher. So I hope you'll shop at all these fine sponsors. Uh, they really are a fine group of people. Now, this is our 83rd year. This is just a few of the publications we've done in the past. I want you to know that our writers have been a virtual who's who of prairie horticulturists. Frank Skinner, Henry Marshall, John Walker, Louis Lenz, Lynn Collicott, and more recently, Wilbert Ronald and Kevin Toomey, to name just a few. And also, if you're looking for a particular garden resource, uh, we have a comprehensive subject index into all articles going back to 1937. Just go to our website, you can see the address up there. And we have also been working to digitize all our past editions, so you may be able to find an opportunity to find uh, old stories. Also, I wanted to say that we've made it into the pages of Manitoba history. And we want to be very thankful to Dr. Gordon Goldsboro, who worked with uh, some of our members to uh, put the Prairie Garden issues from 1937 to 1980 available for our re for researchers and online reading at the Manitoba Hort or the Manitoba Historical Society's uh, website. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldsboro. And uh, we're very proud, I should say, of the partnership that we have formed with the Manitoba Historical Society. Uh, here's some of our more recent editions, and all of these are available at McNally Robinson, but you can also order some of these in many older editions, other older editions, going back to about 1996, directly from us through theprairiegarden.com. And it makes a wonderful gift. I would buy more than one if I were you. This year's edition contains 65 articles by about 50 different writers. I'm delighted to say that many of these contributors are here with us tonight. Thank you all. And this is just a small sample of some of the names you'll see throughout the book. We're also, the theme this year, very proud to present smaller spaces, smaller places in smaller spaces. <laughs> Mr. Tomato's laughing at me. And they're the, the key theme and what a lineup of stories. Shannon Gage has uh, this really beautiful little garden that she built in her backyard, very small, uh, you know, urban area. Kelly Leask has prairie in a pot. Who ever thought of planting a prairie in a pot? Wonderful Deacon Doddridge grows huge crops of, that's rhubarb you see in the picture in Churchill. And the Cadzals, well, they tell us how to garden in the boreal forest in Nova Ming Park. So it's really a potpourri of interesting stories. The story that Greg, Greg, uh, Greg Clausen has to tell is how he built a garden on the rooftop of his garage. And I might mention that Mr. Tomato had a hand in that too, because he often gets his hands in all sorts of things, don't you, Brian? <laughs> and um, take a chance to take a look at what um, our Indigenous community and, um, novelist and contributor to Lifestyles 55, Wayne Douglas Whedon, has written about the contributions that Indigenous people have made to the gardens and the, the crops that we grow today. There's a lot in here, folks. Balconies, potted peppers, tiny water gardens growing vertically. There's writers like Janet Melrose, Diana Dollywall. There is uh, Sandy Benton and Tiffany Grenko. You are going to find this an absolutely invaluable compendium. I think you should buy at least six for all your friends and relatives when it comes to the garden coming up next year. And of course, there's our charming garden committee chair, Ian Wise, who's written four stories. Um, he's got, you know, something that the bane of many people is sucking insects in the winter. We've shown some aphids, but there are all sorts of other ones that plague your houseplants. And he's written about Tayberry. He's written about the evil rose weevil. Honestly, that thing uh, mm -hmm. just absolutely decimates roses. And also, for those of you who live on balconies, how to overwinter potted trees. Here is something really charming. Our youngest gardener, Milan Lukes. He's a champion pumpkin grower, and he tells you how he does it. This is a guy who started when he was 11 years old growing champion-sized pumpkins. And he's very smart and knows an awful lot. And he's a very, very good writer as well. House plants get the second billing this year. And the, there's, you know, there are more and more gardeners turning to having something green in the house in the winter. So we learn about growing fruits such as lemons and vegetables from MPN Nera. Uh, I share some surprising new varieties of house plants that'll get you kind of excited. Susan Oliver writes about cyclamen and Chris Bryan talks about miniature orchids while Mira Sinha shares some of her favorite plants with variegated foliage. We will hear a little bit more from Mira a little bit later on. She didn't disappear on me. Uh, Tim Chapman tells us about the wonders and excitement at the International Peace Garden where great things are happening. 
things, not figs. <laughs> I'm a very bad typist. And we give you a sneak preview of the new gardens of diversity at Assiniboine Park. You really are quite interesting. Oh, there's Mira. She writes on light and houseplants, and you'll hear from her in a few moments. Finally, our own Linda Dietrich, the former editor, tells us what to plant for pollinators. Thank you, Linda, uh, for all your years of leadership for the Prairie Garden. Really, folks, she's she's been with the Prairie Garden for about five years. She's now retired, but she had a tremendous hand in a lot of the things that we're doing today. I would also like to announce your new editor for 2023. I don't have her picture, unfortunately, but her name is Evelyn Lundin. And Evelyn retired after 23 years as an instructor and manager in the nursing program at Red River College. Now she's written many articles for garden magazines and she's well known for, by her coworkers for her, her superb gardening skills and love of plants. So we're looking forward to having you do the 2023 edition of the Prairie Garden. Um, Evelyn, thank you. Finally, let me remind you that 2022 has been declared the year of the garden in Canada. And Winnipeg has also passed its own proclamation that it's the year of the garden in Winnipeg. So the color this year is red. Plant red to flag your support as we celebrate 100 years of the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association and our Canadian garden family. And by the way, side note, we will be the first country in the world to declare it a year of the garden. So we're very proud of that. And we're very proud that Canada's local gardening magazine is the official publication. So finally, the big show is about to begin now. <laughs> Your guest editor, the irrepressible Mr. Tomato. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about Mr. Tomato. Uh, he's a longtime gardener in Manitoba, a journalist who used to write for the Globe and Mail, and an entrepreneur who in introduced sea magic to the marketplace in North America. He also invented cozy coats to get cool weather gardeners a head start in planting and ripening tomatoes. He's been a frequent garden guest on radio, my radio show actually, very often, and his garden was even featured on national television. Mr. Tomato's garden has won 10 major awards for the best garden. Mr. Tomato, over to you. Now, this may take us a minute, folks, while we just uh, make the transition because we're working here together and we're gonna call it Mr. Tomato's uh, PowerPoint and we'll be on with the show. And here we go. Well, let me just do this really quickly. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. And it should, there you go, Mr. Tomato, it's all yours. Oh, I should just point out, Dorothy, the uh, slideshow is not actually being shared. So if you could share the screen, then everyone will be able to oh, see no, the presentation. You're kidding. Oh my gosh. You should let me know. That's terrible. Oh my gosh. Now I'm really flustered. Let me just go back, share the screen. Uh, share screen. Okay, are we there yet? Are we sharing? Uh, not yet, I'm afraid. Why is it sharing? Okay, there we go. All right. Is it up for you now? Uh, it started. We're just waiting to see an image, and there we are. Okay, here we go then. Oh my goodness, what a waste of time. Zoom along with us. I can't believe I did Good afternoon, folks. Well, I'm Mr. Tomato, and you're not. Cue canned laughter. <laughs> Hi, folks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I have my friend, Juicy. Wave to the Zoomers, Juicy. And he and I would like, for starters, to say re really big shout out to all the people who contributed to this amazing publication. And a pre-shout out to everyone who is watching today, who during their garden travels through the spring will be preaching, <laughs> preaching to the garden centers, the managers, the employees, whatever, to make sure that everyone who comes to buy plants obviously picks up the Prairie Garden. It's really a labor of love, nonprofit, amazing publication. Having said that, it's great to be here on February the 2nd. What? 
Mr. Tomato, it's not February the 2nd. Maybe not on the calendar, folks, but you know, the sun has the same intensity today as February the 2nd. Yeah, think about that. So on February the 2nd, you think back, hey, it wasn't so bad. The sun had a little bit of warmth to it. But that's part of the reverse calendar effect. The reverse calendar that I came up with some years ago and actually was sent out to people who were ordering seeds is kind of fascinating because, and I'll explain later, why having a reverse calendar is going to make you look at the weather, the climate, the sun in a little different way. Oh, just a quick word. I looked at my garden uh, before I came uh, to Dorothy's studio here and noticed the geraniums still were surviving. And if you have geraniums, quick tip here, pull them out, invert them, put them in a box, put them in the basement. So simple. Take you five minutes, pull them out, invert them into the box, into the basement. In February, what you do is you bring them out of the basement, you chop off the top part, just leave a two inch stub, plant them up, you'll have great geraniums and you'll save yourself the expense of buying geraniums at five bucks a piece later in the spring. So that's a quickie tip. Also at the end of this uh, little presentation on smaller spaces or smaller places or whatever the topic is, Dorothy and I are having fun with that one. I'm going to show you my favorite gardening picture. And it's more of an emotional picture and it's the smallest garden in the world. <laughs> I'm calling it the smallest garden in the world. Anyways, my favorite gardening picture you'll see at the end of this little presentation. But having said that, I frankly think that a lot of you, I'm going to be talking about uh, smaller places and how to increase the size, make them look bigger. But I think there's tons of talent out there and that you don't need min much help from Mr. Tomato to have already done things to create bigger places from small spaces. But well, without further ado, let's get into the first of my, whoops, going backwards here. Oops, there we go. Okay, suppose, I have a little quiz for you. Suppose this is a, isn't this the gorgeous, this is the Linda Dietrich's uh, yard. She was the editor last year. But if you were brought in as a consultant, and Linda said to you, hmm, do you know of any way I can make this garden look bigger? It's a very small yard, of course, but it's gorgeous. How can I make it a little bigger? Okay, think about this for a bit. You're a consultant. You want to tell Linda how she could give the effect of making this a bigger garden. Just think about it. What would you do? Maybe you might put up a, well, I don't know whether you want a trellis or an arbor. I mean, it's gorgeous the way it is. Spending 60 or $70, you can instantly, she can instantly make this look bigger by attaching a mirror to her back gate. Then the path goes on and on and on, right? You see, so the illusion you get looking into her backyard, if a mirror were there, hey, what's beyond, what, where does this path lead to? And for about 60 or $70, you can do it in your own yard. Dorothy has a mirror on one of her fences. Uh, the cost, like I said, uh, and let me tell you, I phoned around to find out the cost of adding a mirror. And uh, the cheapest place I could see, and uh, they sound like they're very efficient, is Glass Doctor. You, know, you might want to write that down. Glass Doctor. Glass Doctor. 50 bucks, you'll take your piece of plywood. That's the first thing you have to do is uh, uh, get a piece of plywood the size of your gate. You can get that sawed at a local garden or local construction uh, selling place and bring that size of plywood to the glass doctor and for 50 bucks to put a mirror on it. And ta-da, you have a larger space almost instantly, right, instantly. Anyway, that was my recommendation. When I saw this Linda's picture, I said, hey, I think that's something I would do. And so here's something that you can think about for your own yard. Okay, quick transition to my yard, where we'll talk about smaller spaces. I'm laughing because 
when you see my house, <laughs> you won't really see my house. So here we go. <laughs> I know I have to laugh. This is the Google. <laughs> this is a Google map of my house. I, you, you can't see everything all at once. Well, that's one of the principles of creating a larger space from a small space. You know, there's only 15 feet from the front sidewalk to my front steps, 15 feet. But you can't tell that, can you? You don't even know there's a house behind there. It could be acreage. I could have cows and chickens. And, you don't know. So that's one way of creating illusion. Most of you will say, that's not for you. It is for me. Uh, but this is one of the ways of creating a, uh, a mystery as to what is behind trees, shrubbery, whatever. And you'll notice the boulevard has flowers. And so what's happening here is the public sidewalk is like a garden path through my yard. So basically I've added about eight or 10 feet onto my yard without the city knowing it. Well, they do know it, they see my flowers and whatever. And then beyond the, uh, behind the, uh, the public sidewalk, I have a dry stream bed. Let's go to that. Oh, before we look at the dry stream bed, this is the berm in the front, just beyond that public sidewalk in the spring. Now, most of you are, or maybe, maybe you're not that familiar. This is Scylla, the earliest flowering bubble. Well, there's snowdrops, but this after snowdrops is uh, the lovely blue flowering Scylla, south seeds, buy a couple dozen bulbs, throw them in in the fall, they'll come up the next year and they'll seed themselves. You'll see bees way before the bees appear anywhere else, pollinating the Scylla. If you, want to, don't, if you want to remember the name, I tell people, don't be silly, plant Scylla. Don't be silly, plant Scylla. Anyway, I just love this. And it's your first harbinger of what's to come. Love it. And then we see a the same, notice the, uh, looks like gravel is a dry stream bed and the other plants around it, cone flower. And uh, when people come by on the public sidewalk and many people purposely take their afternoon office walks or whatever past my property because they like the growth, uh, you know, the, the jungle effect. Okay, let's go up. Another uh, way of making this garden look bigger is through a diagonal walkway instead of a straight walkway, a diagonal. And for added distance, here we're talking about creating a larger space, for added distance, I put in a bridge. <laughs> so this is 15 feet, remember, 15 feet from the public sidewalk to my public side, to my steps, right? 15 feet. So you see all of this, then you're going to have a diagonal sidewalk with a bridge in the center. There we go. There you go. There's actually a a bridge, see that little, uh, you can see sort of the, the, the railings of that bridge on the right-hand side, uh, leading up to the uh, front sidewalk, uh, the front uh, steps, which are actually uh, covered in cedar. And I hate cement, so I covered them in cedar. So this is the uh, pathway up to my front steps. And actually there's a, a deck on the other side of uh, those steps toward the, toward the left. So look at how much I have in this, Tiny front yard, right? I mean, you have to say, oh my God, Mr. Tomato, that's a lot. I wouldn't, I mean, you may not do it yourself, but these are ways you can create the illusion that you have a lot of space. So there's a private front deck. Let's go to the side. There you see the side of the steps. And then the other side of the steps, there's a deck. And then growing up on the house is Engelman's Ivy. That's the cousin of the Virginia Creeper, Engelman's Ivy. The difference between Virginia Creeper and Engelman's Ivy is Engelman's has little sticky octopus-like feet attached to the stucco. That's how it grows, through little sticky octopus-like feet. So if you want Engelmans to grow without having to twirl around something, Engelmans is the way to grow, go rather than Virginia creeper. And you see ferns and whatever. All of this uh, is an underplanting of a giant spruce tree, right? So if you have a, an issue with uh, uh, space under a spruce tree, nothing will grow. Well, ferns will grow. And uh, also, uh, Lamium, Lamium galliobdalan 
is actually planted there. I don't know if you can see it. Right at the bottom left, right corner, bottom left corner, right corner, there you can see sort of leaves of the lamium, uh, green with a little bit of silver in the leaves. So this is uh, the side of the uh, front of the house. Now let's go up the pathway to the back. I have a little garden shed on the right hand side and just going proceeding. Uh, I've entered many gardening competitions and invariably what the judges say is that when they go into the backyard, it's like a different world. And that's why I've basically won so many awards. They feel like they're transformed into some other place. So let's see if you feel the same way. And the illusions that you'll get are, well, you're going to see little room spaces. You're going to see three decks, three decks, not just one, three. And you're going to see a pond with a waterfall. And uh, you're going to see, well, you're hardly going to see the house from the back either because the planting's right next to the house. Okay, let's see what a judge would see if a judge is coming to judge my yard. There is a first thing the judge would see. It's an arbor on the right-hand side, uh, a pot of uh, oxalis and uh, ivy and coleus uh, hanging from the uh, little shed. Okay, and there's a, an arbor to go into the backyard on the right-hand side, right? You'll see ferns uh, on the uh, uh, left of the, well, I, to the right, looking at it to the right of the arbor. And then if you go around the corner toward my back door, I kind of have an area there with lots of uh, 18 inch uh, uh, square uh, patio stones to create kind of a gathering area, launching <laughs> a launching area, if you will, into the various areas of my city. So you come to the launching area, the gathering area, and then you can go to the back door, you can go to the other side of the yard, you can go to the back. And this is a small yard, I have to say, and Dorothy will tell you, it's a small yard. It's 102 feet deep, okay, my yard. You've seen 15 feet in the front and you're seeing the remainder on the back. And I'm trying to give the illusion like there's tons of space. There's the, my back door, okay? There's a little bench there and uh, the house actually is toward the left and you'll see plantings next to the house. So you don't even see the house. You see this kind of gathering area in my back door. And there's the back door leading into a, one of the decks on the back. And uh, there's a chair there next to my back door. I uh, love canna lilies, the yellow canna lilies. You know what I do in the winter? And actually this canna lily, I have a bay window. And I think uh, bay window adds a lot to a house too. And I always one of the, the uh, most important things I did to the house. It really brings the outside in having a bay window. At any rate, this pot was in the bay window through the winter. It actually produced yellow cannas of flowers in the winter. Can you believe? That monster, this is big outside, but inside it grew about three feet high and produced yellow cannas. So what happened right now is I brought it back in the house. It killed back, uh, died back with no frost. And so I cut, cut it back and I'll take it and put it in the window again and it can do its thing through the winter. There's another view of the back door. The red you see there is from another canna lily in a container and a little sidewalk coming off the back deck. And now this is the other side of the yard. You enter on the right-hand side that you came in from. And then if you go uh, turn left and keep on going to the edge of the garden, that's a round deck. So I have different kinds of decks. That's a round one. And I have uh, on the left-hand side is coleus, of course. A coleus, a uh, great article on coleus, by the way, in the Prairie Garden, written by Igor Kaftan. Excellent. He, he really knows the stuff. Uh, I mean, it's just worth picking up the publication to find out what he has looked at and examined and written about uh, with uh, coleus. He knows all the varieties. And that particular variety is velvet stained glassworks. It's part of the gl stained glassworks series. Velvet is the name of that one. It just grows so luxuriously in the sun. Okay, so we're gonna leave that area and uh, retreat all the... Oh, next to the coleus. The, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Dorothy is just mentioning to me that uh, next to...
Pythonia. It creeps along and uh, establish itself uh, in a, and we're just reading here the internet, uh, well, we're back to, okay. Uh, and it establishes itself and it's a nice addition anywhere to unify the garden, the great unifier, Lamium. Okay, there it is. The uh, coleus that uh, Dorothy was, Dorothy was, she wasn't hovering over me, but she is a kind of a reminder in the background. Thank you for that, Dorothy. But this is the this is the variety that Igor talks about that he likes, and it's one of my favorites. Okay, let's go to the other side. Back to the other side, uh, where the, the entrance to the backyard took place. Uh, the video, the the slide you've seen, seen before that, and here's the back arbor. Now let's go behind that arbor and see what's happening. Okay, leading to out a small greenhouse, about eight by ten greenhouse in the back deck, another deck, right? And the left-hand side, uh, there's hanging off the arbor a fuchsia plant. You can just see the, it's one of my favorites, actually. Let's look at, see this fuchsia? Isn't that wonderful? It uh, drapes over the uh, hanging basket a lot. And I just, I just love that. I just discovered that this year. I'm going to be planting that every year. It drapes over nicely. There's more flowers from the fuchsia. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? There's a close-up of the flowers. And uh, behind it, once again, you're giving, because you're always looking beyond, you don't know what's behind whatever. I mean, that's how you create bigger spaces, right? You have something behind something behind something. And people say, what's there? And they have to go exploring. And what you see behind there is actually a uh, piece of log that was kind of a driftwood type log. And I just propped it up next to my pond. That's my large lily and goldfish pond. So let's go to that. There we go. And you'll see there's a waterfall at the top of the screen in the center. There's a waterfall. And I give the illusion that it's coming from under a spruce tree. Okay. And I have kind of a, an elevation there. You know, I just don't like when, you know, you see a pond and there's no reason for water to be flowing down from somewhere. You just sort of build up a bank and one or a, bit, a mound or whatever. So I get, it, get, it has the illusion that it's coming from somewhere naturally. In fact, I've had so many people that have come and visited my yard and they said, gee, your water bill must be really high because the water is continually flowing. Not realizing, of course, it's just uh, in a circular pattern from the pump up to the fall and back to the pump and it keeps on pumping the same water. And of course, you see the water lilies there. You see the marginal plants, right? Water iris, primarily. And also dwarf cattails on the right-hand side. There are dwarf, dwarf cattails. I got those from a uh, garden center selling water plants in Ontario. I don't see them around. And I told the uh, Kelowna Park people that they're looking for something other than the giant ones to surround their ponds. And I'm actually giving them seeds while they, you know, they produce uh, those brown packed seed seeds that blow in the wind, and I'm going to the very just a fl like fluff, it's like cotton bat and fluff, and I'll give it to them, and uh, they're going to plant the dwarf cattails around their ponds. At any rate, that's my pond, and there's a larger pulled back view of the pond leading to the right deck. It looks kind of like the water goes under the deck, so the deck kind of surrounds the pond rather than the pond, you know, being an off uh, a a uh, separate space. So the pond comes right up to the deck. And then looking more, there we go, another view. Here's the deck. And uh, looking beyond that, actually behind the lattice is the lane. Yeah, I know. Hard to say that tell that that's, that's, that's a lane back there, but it is. That's the back of my garden. This is a southern exposure, and that's why I did this right at the back of my yard to get sun. There's another view. Oh, there's the uh, dwarf cattail on the left hand side at the bottom. There is the little heads of uh, fluffy seeds that they'll be using to plant at the uh, at Kelowna Park around their ponds. And at the top left corner, I think Dorothy is probably chuckling over this plant as many of you might because it's a it's a it's on the list of plants we shouldn't really be planting, but you know, it's so easy to pull out, it's no big deal. That's the Himalayan poppy. 
him, sorry, Himalayan impatience. The Himalayan impatience, indestructible, produces flowers, whatever the conditions are, you'll have a six inch Himalayan impatience producing flowers and one that's uh, 10 feet high producing flowers. And it's really neat, the bees love it. So you have lots of bees around pollinating things and the kids love it because they produce seed pods that look like lanterns. And the lanterns, when the seeds are ripe, explode like a rapidly unfurling banana. The that's right, it's like a, a banana that quickly unfurls and the seeds go flying everywhere. And that's why I guess it's on the Noxious Weeds Act because they say, oh, that goes everywhere, it's gonna take over. Well, it doesn't take over because you can pull it out very easily. It's, uh, it's nothing that you have to dig out or whatever. So that's Himalayan impatience. I just let it grow here and there and it adds a little background. And looking beyond that, this is another view of the pond with the coleus. Uh, I'll have to ask Igor exactly what variety that one is. And there's another view looking back and you'll see in the center of this shot, right on the left-hand side now, left bottom part. Uh, I love the castor bean. I mean, you're not gonna eat the, put the beans in casserole, of course, because castor bean is deadly uh, poisonous, but uh, you know, the plant is wonderful, tropical kind of feel. And then you see that uh, uh, another coleus that I talked about earlier, the velvet coleus in the stained glassworks series. Yeah. And then I have the rain barrel, you'll see, and the, well, I call it a rain barrel. Rain doesn't really, uh, isn't a factor. I filled it with water. And also I have two barrels. And what I do, I use one package of Sea Magic, one package only, and I create a concentrate. Half of the uh, concentrate goes in one barrel and half the concentrate in another barrel. That's all you need, right? And then I add some fertilizer and the Sea Magic and whatever, and about, Every four or five weeks, I'll plant, I'll flow, uh, sorry, I'll uh, water with uh, sea magic uh, in the water with extra fertilizer. Which, by the fertilizer, what the uh, sea magic does, it acts as a booster. It makes the plants be as good as they can be. Okay, that's what sea magic does. That's what uh, it has a hormone-like quality to it. Seedaconins uh, is kind of a hormone-like quality to seaweed, and that's what makes plants be as good as they can be. Sweeter brighter, greener, lasting longer, more blooms, blah, blah, blah. Even makes, if you use any kind of uh, uh, pesticide, it makes that, uh, it makes the pesticide more effective, okay? So if you're having issues and um, feeling that, you know, it, the pesticide isn't doing the job, you can add Sea Magic and it makes it work better. And the uh, greenhouse, by the way, is insulated. I have used it in the winter, uh, not lately, but, uh, you know, it, it's a good storage space as well. And I bring in plants in the, in about February, you know, the sun becomes about mid February is when I start to add uh, plants to the greenhouse because uh, the sun becomes intense. You'll notice that right about mid February, sun becomes very intense. Moving on from there. Oh, there we are. The uh, castor bean plant. Love it. Love it. I started that from seed, by the way. Uh, succulents. Oh my God. I just love succulents. And uh, that's uh, Mangavi on the right-hand side. What I did with these succulents is uh, took them out of that box and put them in the bay window so they will get bigger and be bigger for next year. But uh, succulents, nothing like them. You know, you add a rock, a little bit of stone, whatever. Love succulents. Maybe I'll, you know, I, I have visions of doing a cactus garden, you know, have, creating a, a monster half desert on my yard and saying, you know, I'm bringing cacti for the uh, season because I just love uh, what that kind of feel is like. There, that uh, box is kind of propped up with uh, and with petunias um, uh, below the uh, the box. And Dorothy took some nice pictures. In fact, Dorothy, I, I thank Dorothy for doing all this work. My God. She came to the yard and garden and I don't know, she's just, she's a whiz. I mean, well, obviously, you know, all of the publications she has and she knows how to take the right pictures of the right, like it, to me, this meant nothing. This is Monarda. And, uh, you know, like to me, it was a, a Monarda that had finished blooming and was on its last legs. But look at this. 
Dorothy made it, turned it into a magical picture. Love it. And you'll see Elamium there, Beacon Silver, uh, on the right hand side. You'll see part of the, you'll see a hosta leave on top and the brown uh, uh, leaves, kind of chocolatey brown, is snake root. I don't know if, whether you've ever, I did it for the first year, planted perennial snake root for the first time. Clusters of white flowers, but very late, like not till October. I didn't have any flowers. So I don't know whether I'll get flowers next year in August or September, but it wasn't until October that I got, but the leaves are kind of nice, right? Sort of a chocolatey brown. But isn't this a gorgeous picture? Dorothy sees things that I just don't see, but now you see them and thanks to Dorothy for seeing them. Uh, there's the uh, ubiquitous, what is it? Of course you know. Yeah, I'm just, uh, and I'm, I'm asking the uh, viewing audience here, uh, is, is it lovely though? This is on the uh, band list, come on, come on. Rebecca, once again, the way Dorothy took this picture, wonderful. And uh, then we're looking toward the going in the other direction now, right? Heading off another direction. There's my coffee cup heading in the other direction uh, out of the yard. Going back. And here is a bunch of the, because I have actually a, a rose round where I planted a, a hybrid tea roses just toward the left of all these uh, lamium leaves. Like, isn't this wonderful though? I mean, it's, I don't know, that's something to the yard. And I don't know why we don't use more lamium. I don't see lamium planted in many gardens really. So that's why I'm uh, suggesting that it's something that you may consider doing. And it keeps spreading and you don't have, you buy one plant, you'll have 20 plants in a couple of years. And there's uh, the lamium that Dorothy says, horrors, don't, just, don't show that one. Well, she didn't say don't show that one, but it's not her favorite. Kelly loves the one. And she, but she loves saying the name. She's saying in the back of my, <laughs> saying behind me here, it's Lamium galliobdalon. Galli, you just remember Lamium gal, G-A-L, guys and gals. Lamium galliobdalon. Wonderful. Yuck. <laughs> and Dorothy, Dor 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 I don't know whether you heard her. She said yuck. <laughs> but to me, it's wonderful. And it produces yellow flowers in the spring. And here's another added benefit. How many plants in your garden stay green all winter? Come on, can you name three that remain? Can you name one? Well, this is one. Labium galliobdalin. Leaves look like this. So snow falls in it in January. If you want to see green leaves, here you'll find green leaves under the snow. Labium galliobdalin. Love it. And no more yucks from you, Dorothy, please. Oh, just adding these near the back of uh, this, my, my presentation. What this is, and the reason Dorothy added this to the slideshow, I think, is because this demonstrates growing under lights and what a joy growing under lights is. And I actually wrote a book, little booklet on growing under lights. And this is my favorite seed to plant under lights. Here's why. Great colors, obviously. The plants remain stunted, they remain very low. They, they don't tower and start to stretch above the lights or whatever, they stay low and compact. And they are a wonderful plant that cheers you up after only six weeks from seed, okay? So you plant them at the end of January and the early March, this is what you're experiencing. Or maybe plant them earlier, plant them uh, in December, plant them late December, and in February, uh, you're seeing this under your lights. Isn't this wonderful to wake up to in the morning, right? And so it's a, a favorite, mimulus, right? Mimulus or monkey flower? Monkey flower, mimulus, uh, I think it's a must. If you're planting under lights, mimulus is a must. Now, I mentioned that to the top of the show, it's great to be here in February the 2nd, but it's not. It's really November the 7th, right? That's because of the reverse calendar effect. And you'll notice that here's a calendar from April, going back a number of years, actually. Uh, April, so you have the dates in April, but I have the dates for the reverse calendar on top in small type, right? That's a small. So you'll notice, for example, look at the middle of April, April 16. I'll bet you didn't comprehend that April 16th is all also 
August 26th. In fact, I'd been in Dorothy's pool on August 26th. I don't think I would be in her pool on April 16th. But this, what this does, it shows you, for example, and the reason I came up with this reverse calendar, because of my cozy coats, I wanted to say, hey, gardeners, you can put your tomatoes out in April. Oh, come on, April's cold. No, with cozy coats, keeps the plants protected, and it's August 26th sun. And that's where you're getting your tomatoes ripening, right? So this extends the season in your mind, doesn't it? And how you can think about the reverse calendar, although maybe you're gathering a, getting a screen capture shot of this particular month, but the way to think about it is to go forward in your brain from say March 28th, March 20th or 21st, which is the first day of spring, and then the number of days forward and then, then the number of days backward. And that's how you figure out the reverse effect. So the sun, don't forget the sun, uh, while well, the sun uh, stays in the same place and the earth goes around the sun and the sun tilts one way, but then it goes back, retraces its steps going in the other direction. So that's how you get the reverse calendar effect. It goes one way for winter, back our way in the summer. And so you see April 16th is also August 26th. Isn't that lovely? Come on. I mean, who could not be thrilled? I get excited about little things like this, I know. But, you know, the nuances in the garden really excite me, I have to say. And the nuance here is watching, you know, I could watch a tendril for, for two hours. Here's the deal. A, te a tendril is produced by whatever plant it happens to be, like a cucumber, for example. Most of you, you know, a lot of you grow cucumbers and you have a tendril maybe growing up. And the tendril is produced and waves around. You're not sure where the tendril is going to become fastened to, right? And you say, I, went, I think it's going to attach itself to that wire over there or that pole or whatever, but you don't really know until it really happens. So it sniffs around in the air. And that, to me, that's brilliance. I mean, come on, the universe and the way it works. And then, and this is sort of the coup de grace. Once it grabs onto wherever it's going to grab onto, it coils itself. Isn't that a great way of climbing? It grabs on, then coils itself to draw the main plant you know, up to the up to the wire or the pole or whatever you have that it grows that is growing up. I just think that's fantastic. And so I, I don't know, maybe I'm the only person that sits in the garden looking at watching a tendril and then coming back two years, two hours later and seeing where it, where it's fastened to. But to me, this is amazing stuff. So now finally, here we go. Coming along is my favorite gardening picture of all time. And I know, <laughs> I know this is not gonna be what you think of as being a typical gardening picture, but let me say this about that. It's an emotion and it's the tiniest garden you'll ever see. <laughs> How's that for a lead in? A teaser. This is my favorite gardening picture. Look at that. Um, amongst all the gardening pictures on my home, and I have a lot of them, this is my favorite. I call this determination. This goldenrod came up in a crack between the curb and the sidewalk. Busiest, one of the busiest thoroughfares in Winnipeg. Semis rumble along there. Buses rumble along there. See the pieces of asphalt on the sidewalk from the hole that it created, that a truck created or a bus created. But here you have the determined goldenrod. I'm going to bloom, damn you. I'm going to bloom here. I love it. <laughs> so that's my favorite gardening picture. I have to say it's, it's emotional. I have it in my, it just, it gives, it inspires me, I have to say. Yep, that's me, Dorothy said. Let's get a picture of you. That's well, been fun, folks. And let's get, head back to Dorothy. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Tomato. You did a fantastic job, way better than I did, because I forgot to put the share screen on. But let's just come to the end of this and take a few moments to introduce our friend, Mira Sinha. And she uh, is an amazing gardener. 
uh, has done some fantastic things with houseplants and has been learning a lot about light. So here we go, Dr. Mira Sinha, recently retired from a long career as an obstetrician and gyne gynecologist. She's a passionate gardener and an active member of the um, Manitoba Master Gardener Association, as well as being an important member of the Prairie Garden Committee. And I think she's ready to go and uh, she'll do a lot better job than I did because I forgot to share my screen, but I see she's already up there. Take it over, Amira, off you go. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, John and Ian, for giving me the privilege of speaking before this wonderful select audience. I love plants. Plants are fascinating. No matter where in the world we have been or where we live now, there are plants to nourish us, body, mind, and soul. It has never failed to amaze me that plants can create their entire selves using the energy of sunlight, water with nutrients, and carbon dioxide, and that we can only produce some vitamin D under our skins. We find plants wherever the visible spectrum of sunlight, which we perceive as white, reaches. We find them under the Arctic ice as pelagic algae and in the ocean as red algae. We find them in the deserts as cacti. On the prairies in the summer, the sunlight is in abundance and it can last as long as 17 hours in the month of July. And because of that abundance, we find annuals, we find beautiful perennials, shrubs and trees, and the resulting production of flowers, vegetables and fruits. But the seasons change. And as the shorter days of our long winter arrive, we have to rethink gardening. For it's not the same. Plants need light, for light is crucial to them. And in less than a milli, millisecond, it is absorbed by pigments to start the myriads of photochemical events they need. When I look at the leaf of the angel wing begonia, I'm reminded of a busy internet. Because when I see the, leaf, the sunlight coming through the red leaves and shining on the glistening metallic silvery spots, it tells me that there's a lot going on underneath this, the leaf surface than we can see. In January, the daylight is as little as 7.5 hours. The sun is higher in the sky in the summer and is at a lower level in the winter. And that's a good thing for the light can reach further in into our rooms. But it's not the same. Light outdoors, the abundant light outdoors is rich. Light coming in through our windows is absorbed, reflected, refracted, scattered during its entry, and the UVB rays are absorbed. House plants or indoor plants are basically tropical plants. And we need to, in the tropics, many of them are under the full sun, they flower under the full sun, but many are in the shade as understory plants. And these understory plants live in the shade. So to bring, grow these plants indoors, we have to provide a similar condition and try to simulate, imitate the conditions that they would have if they were in the tropics. So what do we have? We have the red light. When the sun, before the sunrise, the red light arrives before the sunrise. 
And as the sun rises, the full spectrum of the white light removes the red and a blue sky emerges. And you can marvel for a few minutes with your morning coffee if you look to the south at the peachy orange reflection from the bare tree trunks before it vanishes. At the end of the day, witness the prairie sunset, the brilliant colors. The far red light is the last to leave as it turns down the plant switch to decrease the activity in the leaves and plunge into restorative darkness. So for growing plants indoors, we need to remember the light. The light coming indoors through the windows is determined by the size of the window and the direction that the window is in. And the windows aren't necessarily all in a north, south, east, or westerly direction. They may be at an angle. The north window is the most challenging as it receives only the cool indirect light. So for this room with the north in the north window, choose the low light tolerant plants for this room or those that can survive in it. The east facing window faces, receives a bright but cool morning sunlight and indirect light for the rest of the day. Veteran master gardener and vice chair of the Prairie Garden, Sandra Venton told me a while ago that this is her preferred window for the plants. And I agree with her. As the sun moves higher and the bright warm sunshine enters the south window, it enters the, it stays there for several hours in addition to the indirect light at other times. Plants with a thick cuticle, spines, and narrow leaves, such as the succulents and the rosemary, do well in this environment. Flowering plants such as the bougainvillea and the hibiscus, too, like the south. If the plant is getting a lot of sun, we may find that it changes the pigmentation in the leaf. And over here, you can see the triostar, the leaf is turning a pale pink creamy color, whereas the dracaena maintains a strict military style variegations. For the west window, the light is similar to the south, bright and warmer, but the duration is shorter. Maybe not so good as the east window, or the south window, but we can grow many plants in here nonetheless. Shade loving plants need to be a few feet away from the heat and the light of the window. We can try moving plants around and see where they are enjoying the space. And we'll notice sometimes if we have the coleus in a very bright location that the pigments may disappear and the chlorophyll takes over. We see the croton, br bright green chlorophyll and rich leaves emerge in the bright sunshine. But if you want the nicer pigmented jewel-like colors emerge, we just have to put it into the dapple shade. There's so many varieties of plants available for us to select from. We have a big, big range of choices that we can make. And all we need is a good book in our hand to enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mira, and uh, that was a wonderful presentation. 
as was yours, Mr. Tomato. I think uh, I've got my video off again. There we go. And um, really, I, you know, very much a lot to learn from both of you. You're both great gardeners. Uh, but now we have time for a few questions and answers. And I think John is going to field those questions for us. John? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Uh, so we do have a few questions in the Q&A already, and uh, we are just at the top of the hour, but we do have time to go over a few things. Uh, so there were a few quick questions for Mr. Tomato first. Uh, the first is from Tess, who is wondering, what did you use for insulation in your greenhouse? Is it heated? Yes. And what did I use for insulation? It was, well, like I had a carpenter build it. I didn't build it myself. And use the normal ins house insulation. Nothing different from what you would normally use in a house. And thick windows, I had double, double paned windows actually. And Diane was wondering where you pick up sea magic. Just about any garden center has sea magic. They don't all call it sea magic, though some call it sea, seaweed powder. Oh, or, seaweed, yeah it's, yeah, it's seaweed. It's a seaweed concentrate, it's a powder basically. And some actually, uh, at least one gardening catalog sells it as a uh, concentrate. Now, William was wondering, Amira, do you want to comment on any problems with an extremely cold winter, uh, old glass windows, and, for instance, and houseplants? Um, I put in uh, triple pane windows, and um, so I'm not having any problems. And the room I've built, especially for my houseplants, because I like them so much, uh, is attached to the house. So it's heated. Oh, thank you very much. Now I will encourage if anybody does have any questions, feel free to write them into the Q&A. Uh, Tess was wondering, how do you get molds in indoor houseplants in winter? Molds? Molds. M-O-L-E-S or M-O-U-L-D-S? M-O-L-D-S? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you've got molds in your house plants, you've got a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you have them outside, chances are you picked up some spores uh, in the outdoors and brought them in with you. So that's one of the challenges of taking house plants outside. But the advantages of taking house plants outside are that they really thrive with the, with the light surrounding them, coming from all sort of ambient directions and not being filtered, as Mira said, by glass or some other uh, vector. So I uh, give them a good wash, Mr. Tomato. How do you what do you do when you take yours in? When I take in my plants, yeah. Yes. Nothing special. Uh, I have two bay windows, which really uh, make it better these days. I didn't always have bay windows, and basically I just uh, put them there. And once in, the interesting thing is, you'll see this giant flying thing. I'm not sure what the name is. It looks like a mosquito with. Uh, long wings, you know, about three inch long wings. And uh, so I get credit sometimes an insect. I, basically, you know, I really haven't had an insect issue. I just bring in the yeah. plants and I've, they've been fine. But the mold is, is really, uh, you know, it's like powdery mildew or something like that. So you can spray them with coffee spray. Uh, there's a number of different parodics on the marketplace that'll, that'll provide that uh, protection for you if you see any of it. But generally, uh, it's, uh, you may be watering your, your plant too much that can cause some fungus to grow on the soil, Amira? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think overwatering may be a factor in there. Yes. And you should let the uh, plants uh, dry out on top, I think, for the most part, that's a really good uh, policy, right, Amira? You yes. Let the, uh, let the soil dry out on top before you water. Touch, I, it. Touch yeah. it with your finger, and if it feels damp or, or, or wear it, don't water it, leave it. Yeah. If it feels damp, don't water it. Yeah. You don't have to stick your finger right in like some people recommend. I don't like getting that dirt up my fingernails. But, but if you touch it, you can tell whether it's dry or not. And you'll also see if it's too dry, it'll shrink away from the sides of the pot. That won't hurt it as long as the plant's not wilting. Overwatering is probably one of the biggest killers of house plants. So yeah, don't be so kind. I'd say number one. Quite often we suggest that we water the plant from underneath, put it in the, water the dish underneath rather than from top. Yeah. That might also help. And on that topic, Diane was wondering if sprinkling cinnamon powder on top of the soil helps for mold. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I've used it for seedlings. And uh, if there's been an, there's, there's an issue of the seedlings when they're coming up and you can see a little bit of mold forming around the seedling. I've, 
I have uh, cinnamon in a uh, salt shaker and I sprinkle the uh, cinnamon around the plants and that that stops it. It stops it. I always learn something from Mr. Tomato every day. <laughs> Another question for Mr. P uh, Mr. Tomato comes from William, who says, I see a beautifully diverse garden, packed right. How do you establish new plants in such density? Uh, how do I? <laughs> You're doing that right now with your, with your roses, your tea roses. Yeah, I change things around. I mean, the garden now is different from the way it was when I moved in, obviously. There was nothing there. There was a ramshackle garage. And, a side drive and uh, it's, it's changed over the years. It becomes different every single year. And uh, new space, well, I just uh, change things around. I'll say, you know, this year I'm going to create a uh, berm where there wasn't one before or uh, dig out. I, I won't plant the tomatoes there this year. I'll plant them somewhere else. And I just move things around in the garden. And basically it's, I use, my entire garden as a starting point each year. It's like a starting from the beginning, but not quite starting from the beginning. So basically, I see nothing wrong with uh, changing things around. You, you have to be willing to sacrifice some of your favorites too and dig them up and divide them and give some, some of the bounty to neighbors if you want to add new things. And by the way, I'm a very bad example of that because I have a very crowded garden as well. But yeah, it helps to move things around. It helps them to divide them, dig them up, but give them some new space, maybe a little bit of breathing room because that's where you can get powdery mildew and stuff if things are overcrowded and there's not enough air circulation. But you got to do a little work for that. And I'm not always that ambitious. What I, what I have found, though, it's an amazing how much thoughtfulness goes into you know, each thing you do in the garden. You think about, if you do this, what will happen there? What will happen? And you see new varieties that you want to get in. Or you have a new feeling about plant, like for example, hybrid tea roses. I didn't really have hybrid teas, and I, even though I loved them for a number of years, and I said I need to have this area for hybrid teas. So I took out whatever was there from before. I had begonias and impatience in that area, and I got a little more light because of the big storm we had back in November a couple of years ago. Was it or was it last last year? Time yeah. means nothing anymore. Yeah. At any rate, we had a big storm, so I had a lot of pruning done. And so I had, it opened up my backyard, so I was able to have hybrid teas growing up. And I just love hybrid teas. I mean, it's hard not to love hybrid teas. So I'm uh, putting leaves around them now, and I'm going to add some soil so that I keep them, uh, you know, growing through uh, the uh, ugly winter we had. This is a question for Mira from Greg, uh, and you'll forgive my pronunciation, being a non-gardener myself, shamefully. Mira, I love the idea of bringing one's favorite coleus indoors. My coleus got mealybug on them in my greenhouse last winter. Do you think that would be avoided indoors? You know, this is an excellent question for Ian. He's, uh... Yes. He's the sucking, it's a sucking insect. And uh, if Ian took, so, took off his, his um, um, Yes, unmuted himself and uh, let us see his lovely face. You can answer that question. Ah, <laughs> uh, here I am. Yes. Usually, coli. Uh, if you have mealybugs, it's generally a problem uh, associated with um, uh, excess amounts of moisture. Uh, if you keep uh, your plants dry, it pretty well solves the problem primarily. But it's um, usually mealybug is, is an indication of once again some of the problems you get if you overwater. And you take advantage of that situation. So, if you can avoid that, you'll uh, and keep the keep the plants reasonably dry. As I say, a dry surface that helps to knock the populations back quite a bit. They just don't but, like that. Ian, when you get kneeling bugs, I've always never had any luck getting rid of them. What do you do? Can you get rid of them, or should you just toss the plant? Yeah, they're a very difficult insect to get rid of once you get. As I say it's more of an environmental problem. I think that what the issue happens quite often is that people will have a problem in which they've created an environment which is optimal for the mealybug. And they try to say, well, I can get rid of it just by spraying it up, but they keep the environment that's suitable for the mealybug all the time. So the insect is very difficult to get rid of because you have a number of different stages, have different levels of susceptibility. A lot of them when they produce eggs in that, but well, you're not killing those eggs when you're actually trying to kill off the mealybug. So end up, you get reinfested and reinfested. It's simply a matter that you should use, in some cases, use cultural practices in which what you do is you try and minimize the optimal an optimal environment for that insect. And that will help kind of mitigate the problem. Because if you just keep the same environment that's suitable, they'll just come, keep coming back. And then and, and they will um, 
invade your other plants as well. So if you have an infested plant, I would really isolate it or get yeah. rid of it. Yeah, there, there are, as you say, I think you quickly find out in any sort of garden setting that the mealy bug is pretty pref preferentially will, will stick to certain, I know succulents are bad for this. People often, uh, especially when they overwater the succulents, they're always wondering why the succulents always getting these mealy bugs. And once again, it's a problem of overwatering. So I think you've mentioned earlier about some of the hazards associated with overwatering on the plant, but sometimes the hazards can be the fact that you create the environment by overwatering, which will now allow something else, whether it be a, an insect problem or disease problem to take to control. And, uh, and that's, I say, with, with that, that's it's simply is just a matter of good, good, uh, good gardening practices. Let me ask you this, Ian, uh, in a greenhouse, which I think uh, the uh, viewer is commenting about having the mealy bug in. Yeah. Um, at the end of the season, I say, say this person's having mealy bug issues through one season. Is there something he can do at the end of the season when he's oh, yeah. out of the greenhouse? Should, oh, yes. it, should it be scrubbed down thoroughly with, should it be? Certainly, uh, the, key, the key of course is to, if you can at least, just simply, yes, you have to clean out all your containers, make sure there isn't any soil around because it's, the, the insects will be actually, in some cases, um, different reproductive, uh, potentially, um, this case here, like eggs or things of that nature, and you just have to clean out the soil basically and get it to the point where you're 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 undertaking a practice which you would do. I would say it's kind of like very similar practices that you do in trying to control a a, fung a fungal problem or that that nature because there's a lot of similarities between the two and they both seem to be most suited if you can if you leave the environment in a situation that they can allow it to reinfest. So start, start anew, get rid of all the soil you have previously in your greenhouse and um, so I, I clean as everything down, as you say, just make sure you just do under a good cleaning disinfect. program. Disinfect. Yeah. disinfect? I don't think you really have to disinfect as much as you just have to do a good, good cleaning. And that, I think that's probably it's, I guess what it is, it's really come many respects. The mealy bugs, just an indication, I think more and more, more or less is that you're doing something wrong. In the and the garden and the garden's telling you you're doing something wrong here because uh, I'm not equipped to actually con to combat an insect problem because I'm only adapted to be able to do it when the when growing conditions are optimal for me. But if you weaken me, I become susceptible and you make it so it, it's it's just simply you have to maintain good practices. Just one just one other thought, which Mr. Tomato has alluded to in the past, and with regard to something like uh, sea, sea magic, it really does help keep your plants. Um, their their uh, metabolism in a way in a, in a place where it can ward off those kinds of infections both from insects and from plant pathogens such as yes uh, yes yeah a lot of cases what a lot of it, a lot of plants i think what the key on some something like that is a lot of the plants are at their most susceptible when they're young when they get older they be, they develop a tolerance because they get a thicker cuticle insects have a lot more difficult time feeding on them and in many cases what happens is the insect can still feed on it but it takes so much energy to feed on it that they just can't really get established to any extent so yeah if you can if you can use any strategy which which uh, minimizes the time that it's spent as a seedling whatever you'll end up with a much healthier plant good stuff absolutely um now this is a two-pronged question for you mira an anonymous attendee would like to know what that lovely flowering plant is behind you <laughs> and uh then diane was wondering what window might be best for her african violets and how she might get them to bloom um, the plant behind me is a triastar, Stromance sanguine, and it's not a, it, the, the flower that we're seeing behind me is actually a bougainvillea, which is poking its head in the way. But the triastar also has a beautiful flower, and um, I showed it in some of my, in my slides. Um, I'm not terrific with going back on my slides currently, but the flower behind is a bougainvillea to answer your question. And the plant behind me is a tri uh, stromanth sanguine, known as triostar and sold as tricolor. It's a beautiful plant and I would love to recommend everybody try that inside their homes. And for the African violet, um, I've got an African violet growing currently in my west window, but I'm told that the east window is great for it. 
basically, I think if it can be in a warm, bright spot, but not too much, ex not too much heat and have some humidity uh, around it and the dish around it, I think it'll do well. But we have master gardeners here, um, maybe listening in on the show, and they would have far more greater experience than I. Thank you so much, Vera. As I just typed in the chat, we uh, are just approaching uh, the close of the event, but we do have a few more questions in the Q&A. So we'll just get to those and then we'll wind down the afternoon with thanks for you all for your contributions. Uh, Trish was heard that she could plant some seeds now before hard frost. Do you have any suggestions as to which seeds do best pre-planted here in Manitoba? Oh, there's so many. Well, you can plant anything. You know what? What happens is people say, well, impatience are tender, therefore you can't plant impatience seeds. But then again, Himalayan impatience, you don't bring them in. The seeds stay frozen through the winter. Um, I had great success, believe it or not. Canna lilies produce seeds, of course. And I had a volunteer seed that landed in somewhere last from last year or the year before or wherever. But I had a canna seed that sprouted, canna lily, right? Those outside? are the ones. Yeah, outside. After weathering the winter, and uh, it sprouted these big, giant, you know, tropical leaves, the canna lily. And I actually took a picture of it because that one seed, because people don't normally think about planting cannas from seed, that one seed produced one nice, nice plant, didn't flower, but four feet high, and two bulbs offshoots that were ready to start coming into leaf as well. That one seed, uh, and I dug it out and I took it in uh, to keep it for next year, but from one seed. So you can even plant canna seeds. You may not get flowering the, the first year, but I'm sure I'll get flowers the second year. So there's any kind of seed, but seed, 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 in fact, some seeds need the uh, winter, uh, the winterizing, and what goes through winter to condition the seeds to start uh, blooming next year. And some of those would include things that you see self-seeding in your garden. So if you plant such things as cosmos or bachelor buttons, you'll see them coming up year after year. Cal calendulas and other. There's all sorts of them. So any annual uh, that um, produces a lot of seed and will come up the following year. You can also buy the seeds and plant them. That's a really easy school, uh, rule of thumb for folks who are not very confident and are a little bit worried about what to do. So uh, look for plants that can self-sow and they get through. But Mr. Tomato's right. I've had to, I've had petunias self-sow. So you just uh, you have to have the right conditions. I don't think there's any seed that you can't plant. I really don't. I don't. I'm trying to think of what. Do you know of any seed that you've ever heard of? I've never tried to plant tropicals outside. So. <laughs> but I'm sure that, uh, you know. It, it, but it's worth an experiment. I think we should is. all try yeah. this. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Uh, Trish is planning to overwinter her lemongrass plants and cut them to two inches from center. Any advice as to where to store them in the garage or uh, outside covered? Store why store them? Why not restart them? You, you know, you can buy lemongrass in the grocery store and start it by putting it in water. So she could store it, I think, the same as any other root, but uh, you, should, you could also just have lemongrass throughout the year. This is a question for Mr. Tomato. Just curious, how long does it take to water all your plants outdoors? You have so many. And do you have an overall preferred watering method, foliar watering or at the base? Generally water from the top. I have two barrels that I dip the watering cans into. Right. Uh, you yeah. water by watering can? I water by watering can. And because I don't like, you know, the, I prefer to have the water standing for a bit and then I have the uh, seaweed or sea magic or a little bit of fertilizer or whatever in the watering system, just like the greenhouses, because that's how the greenhouses have uh, all their plants looking lush. So for my plants to be lush, I have things happening and I'll even throw some, uh, maybe some uh, turkey trot, which is a uh, manure, right? Turkey manure into a barrel. And so you have a lot of interesting things happening in the water uh, that I like to. So you, basically, it's not that uh, labor intensive, actually. I, I mean, I have two watering cans. I will, I, you know, I- Do you, you know, water your perennials though? You don't? Well, no, the, I do use a uh, 
sprinkler for watering because it has been a dry year, as you know. And I need to, <laughs> here's something, I need to have the lushest boulevard grass in the city. <laughs> I think that, that that having lush green grass sets off your whole yard, basically. So probably I water the boulevard more than I water anything else, just to have lush green grass and people are coming by to say, hey, this is, you know, kind of nodding their, their uh, you know, their, their feeling that of affection for the garden and, you know, what the labor I've gone through. So I use a hose and I do use watering and you have to water inten intensely, of course. Uh, when it gets that as dry as it's been. But yeah, I just do use watering cans uh, basically, and it's not that much. I mean, I'm a very bu busy person otherwise, and I seem to manage. Besides, it's, just, it's a labor of love, right? We love our gardens. We go out with the watering cans, and we don't mind really, you know, being, we're basically taking in our gardens at the same time that we're working in our gardens. So it's Thank a combination. You. Thank you. So just before we hear from uh, the chair of the Prairie Garden Committee, Ian Wise, once again, there was one final question uh, from Jordan, who was wondering if you were willing to offer any hints on next year's topic. Well, I think Ian will be able to answer that better than we will. So we'll let him do that. I just want to say that before we go, I, I feel so guilty because I didn't share my screen and I want you folks to see some of our sponsors here and some more in here. You just take a look, you'll recognize their, uh, their, 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 um, logos, because these guys really do make a difference for us. And most of these people also carry the Prairie Garden in their uh, in their shops. So as well as John and John, we're not in competition, but I know that you're always very generous in terms of sending people wherever they need to go, the closest place to buy the Prairie Garden. So thank you very much. Well, maybe I could, you know, it won't take long to read these some of these names, but I, I want to say that I conclude, I mean, what we're here for all of us, we're doing this out of a labor of love. None of us is getting anything uh, in terms of uh, you know payment for what everything we're doing or the writing of the articles, etc. So all of us, I think, should be going out when we go to buy our plants uh, wherever we go. Talk to the managers, talk to the staff, get them to do whatever they can do to get the damn uh, you know Prairie Garden uh, book on the uh, book stands there wherever and close to the. Uh, cashier uh, checkout or whatever. There you go, Barry. John's got it. And let me. And you can definitely get it at uh, McNally Robinson Bookshop. So and, and here's the deal. Here, Aubin Nurseries, Jeffries, Lindenberg, St. Mary's Nursery, TNT Seeds, Tree Time, Jensen's Nursery, Kickenhoff. I started at Kickenhoff, by the way, in my university years. Started at Kickenhoff. Uh, the Lily Nook, love that place. Prairie Originals, Sage Garden, Shelmerdine. So there you go. Some of the names here that people have contributed. Now let's get the book out there and sold because that, I mean, all these people put this huge labor of love into their articles, their time, their effort, whatever. I think that it should be honored. They should be honored for their contribution by having lots of books go out and in the hands of readers. And now over to Ian. Well, I... I, I initially was, uh, my objective was to uh, actually go through all the individual ones. It looks like Mr. Tomato beat me to the punch, but yeah, those uh, kind of what I'm looking at here is an opportunity for um, all our, our, all our uh, people who actually buy our book is just to give an idea about um, kind of look a peek under the hood, I guess, when it comes to the actual fairy garden. And as Mr. Tomato has indicated, one of the main factors we have, I look at it, there are two really important groups that really allow us to actually function as a sustainable sort of a, a group, uh, organization, and be able to produce this wonderful book every year. It is, as mentioned, is that uh, our sponsors, it is they're very important. I think for most nonprofit organizations like we are, which rely on volunteers, we really require the help of sponsors in order to provide us with with um, that little kind of little bump, if you know what I mean, that we can actually allow us to actually enhance our product, keep our product at a lower price. And it really help, it helps out in terms of allowing us to be able to function on a, on an ongoing basis. And uh, with, with a little bit, we're nonprofit, but of course, in any sort of nonprofit group, you have to have some sort of financial, uh, obviously, uh, gain every year in order to just sustain yourself just from an inflationary perspective. So. Yeah, thanks for mentioning all those names. And um, 
they are vital. They're very vital in terms of, of being successful for any in, for organization. Ian, just one more thing about the yeah. book. Itself. You know what people are going to be surprised at when they pick up a copy? Pardon me? Do you know what people are going to be surprised at when they pick up a copy in a garden center? You know what what's going to surprise them? I'll tell uh, you. I'll tell you. No, no, I'm going to tell you. I, I, yeah, no, you I, better answer. I think it might be a rhetorical question here, I hope. Yes. Yes, it's a rhetorical question. They're going to be surprised at the weight. Of oh, yes. It, oh, it yes. Is, and that shows the quality. Amazing yes. quality, amazing reproduction, amazing pictures. This weighs a ton. Well, I shouldn't say weighs a ton. doesn't weigh a ton. But it is a substantial, heavy, well-published and printed uh, publication. Better than, you know, so many out there. It really is amazing how good this is in so many respects. I just, um, you just got a good point you made that is that this book, of course, from the standpoint of, um, we of course are very concerned about the weight simply from the standpoint of uh, when we ship the product out to, uh, to people. So, because everything is, is based on weight when you ship a product like this in packages. And yes, this is by far the heaviest version of the Prairie Garden that we've uh, <laughs> ever produced. So, so that does influence in terms of our, our actually, uh, in terms of what we're gonna end up have paying for shipping costs, but. It, it's it's a minor component actually in the overall scheme of things the weight involved here but yes it is by far the weight heaviest and over the years we've seen that increase over the primarily because well usually the book is getting a little bit thicker we've got more pages in it than we have ever before but the paper quality is is has been substantially improved and that's primarily in order to provide these vivid colors these beautiful photos you'll see in this one here just gorgeous ones you need a paper thick enough such that you won't get any bleeding effect from one from one page to the next. It, it's these beautiful colors, and uh, the, the premier has uh, pre, have uh, which we're dealing with here. They did a tremendous job in, in that, and um, yeah, I, I think that's the thing that they they will see is that it's it's really quite a and it's a book. It's a real book, and I think the book is 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 um, really more more enhanced by the fact of the paper quality, and I think people will will treasure it from that perspective and. Uh, so it's yeah, it's it's um yeah the weight is is as they say it is heavy and it was I noticed I gave it to my wife and she said oh this is getting a little bit heavier than usual I'm like well that's so it and weighted and sure enough it is so so yeah that's so um yeah that's kind of been, it's been a very interesting sort of uh, kind of a uh, aspect regards to uh, what now is going to cost but but for everyone out there in terms of it's interesting in purchasing it there is no if you purchase a purchase a product. Um, from us and you need to get it shipped out, I guess also from John's standpoint, you should be got one book. It's still the pricing, the actual weight is not gonna impact whatsoever the actual charge. It's still gonna be the same. Ian, we Ian, have a lot of flexibility there. Ian, yes. charge for it by the pound. <laughs> charge for it by the pound. <laughs> pound, what is that? We have to deal with metric nowadays. So That's true. <laughs> okay, I think, I think John is looking at the high sun, so. So um, one other thing I would like to do is um, is also, this is an opportunity for us just to also mention about the volunteer groups that the volunteer people that we have with us. And I, they're really important and needless to say, these volunteers put in countless, countless hours uh, because there's so many different sort of moving parts that we have to um, have to actually work with when you actually put purchasing a book. So we, we have a number of groups that are involved here and I would like to um, recognize the contributions made by these, our sales group. Our sales group's been tremendous in terms of uh, providing this product, in terms of uh, making it available to as many people as possible. They're headed up by Rita Campbell. We also have Val Morrison. And of course, you've met Mira, Mira Senna, as well as Bill Dowie. They're just been a great job. We have an administrative group. Uh, you know, like any other organization, you have to have a group which is involved in the actual overseeing the operation, the financial component of it. Uh, within that group, Karina Cavallino is our treasurer, and she's done a tremendous job in terms of creating budgets so that we can actually, from year to year, make sure that we produce a qua high quality book and still uh, still be sustainable as a as an organization in the future. Monique Rubowski, Monique is the one who does the all when you order a book from us. I don't care whether you're a retailer, whether you're an individual. She's the individual that turns that that order around into an invoice. Out it goes. So fabulous job. Fred Poole's our secretary. Fred keeps the actually historical record. Um, our minutes, surprisingly, when you know, when you go to a meeting, 
and you somebody's sitting there and you talk and that little per, that person there is taking the minutes that's a legal document and so that's very important so we have to keep our records like that in order to let me have that sandy venton our co-chair as you know sandy she's been with us for many many years and she's uh if you ever read an article you'll love her wit or little sarcasm stuff it's just beautiful writing and uh we're very appreciative of Sandy. She's been with us for quite a while. Also, we have uh, technical, the technology. Uh, we've adopted technology at, um, at the Prairie Garden. We've probably adopted more of the technology than we ever have over the past few years so that it's influenced how you can purchase your product, how you pay us, and how we can actually see what product we have available and, and all the different events that might be coming up. We keep you highly informed. That's all being capable hands, right? We have Tom Nagy, who they, who's our website man. Sarah Piercy, we're getting the social media because, of course, our concern is that we have to try to appeal to that, that young demographic upcoming, and Sarah is really on top of that. And Maggie Shen, we do all of, most of all of our meetings are just like now, video conferencing. We're hopefully one day we'll get back into in-person, but in the interim, video conferencing is the way we go, and Maggie Shen is the one who takes care of that for us. Uh, of course, our editorial group. We have the two people right there. You know, you've been introduced. By far, folks, the editor job is the most challenging, without question. And Dorothy, you did a fabulous job and be able to handle that. You're almost like a juggling artist, all the different things that you had to do. It is very much, much a challenge. Brian, you're, 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 <laughs> I have to say, your art, your unorthodox style is very appreciated. It kind of brings a comical light to all this. We much appreciated that. We also have a, another group. We actually, what we do is that while we have a central group, we also have some what's called associates. And these are people who actually on their sidelines, they help us out whenever the need arises. So although our committee does involve most of the group, but we have to have that extra group to help us out in editing cases, scientific advisors, you name it. That's all that umbrella all sort of group. And some of the people are most important are Diane Takeout, Suzanne Simpson, Doris Bay Olton, Warren Otto, done great. I also want to just close it up with our group. Want to give one special thank you, one attention to a lady who's been with us for 46 years. She is still writing articles. You go into there, you'll see her name. And I swear to God, over the years that she's probably written three or four of these books entirety in her career. And that's Susan Oliver. She's still, she's in her 90s, she's still writing, and she's just a fabulous person, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge, and, and that's kind of like that. She's the history right there, and, and she's just a wonderful lady. Uh, finally, of course, I'd be remiss without thanking McNally Robinson. Uh, this is the 24th straight year we have, 24 straight years now. We've had our launch from McNally Robinson. We're extremely appreciative of that. We're, uh, it's, it's been wonderful for us because it's allowed us to get our book out in the, in the maximum sort of exposure. And we're very, very appreciative of that. So thank you, John, and thank you as well. You've been just a tremendous host. Uh, I think we'll all be very, uh, uh, you've given, given us a really good sort of, of stage with which we can kind of present ourselves, whether that be in a comical fashion or just an informative fashion. We're very, very much appreciative of that. And uh, I guess all we can do now is um, hope that a year from now, I don't know what's, what format we'll be in, but a year from now, we'll be all getting back together in some form or another with our, with our gardening friends and uh, introducing you our 2023 version, which is in its infancy. We're just starting out now. We're now entertaining a theme that we're right now thinking about. We haven't nailed it down. Our members are, one of the things are, we, we do kind of as an, as an audience uh, amongst our, our committee uh, decide what the theme we would like to do, but certainly you, you, certainly all the people here present. If you have some ideas on a theme, let us know. You can get in contact me at iwise.shaw.ca. Uh, uh, tell me what you'd like to do have have because it's really really important that we meet, remain focused and remain focused on the aspirations and the needs of the gardeners right now. So and um, yeah, and I think that. Uh, that pretty well sums it up. Thank you very much. And uh, happy gardening to everybody. And uh, thanks for uh, attending this. Thank you, John. Thank you. All the best. Thank you very much.